Today, the end of today, we'll be halfway through this course, and about 85% of the way through Anderson's book, So, um, which I know is the biggest trial that some of you experience is trying to read his book. I think, as I said earlier, I don't agree with some of the things he said, and by the way, I'll mention uh, something some of you may not have heard me say to John. He will fairly regularly refer to things that, like the Elohistic Psalter, which are 40 of the Psalms that were written with Elohim as the name of God. He will talk about the priestly source, the priestly traditions, or the Deuteronomistic traditions. All of those are references back to the documentary hypothesis that I started you all out on three weeks ago. The idea that the Pentateuch, but perhaps even more than the Pentateuch, some people talk about the Hextateuch, meaning that Joshua was part of that tradition as well, that there are multiple sources or writers, none of whom, the liberal scholars would say, were Moses, that he didn't have anything to do with it. They are the Yahwist, the Elohist, the priestly tradition, and the Deuteronomistic. And so when you read that in Anderson's book, that's his way of saying he agrees with them that these various pieces he's talking about at whatever time are part of that priestly source tradition or the Deuteronomistic source tradition or the Elohistic source tradition. Okay? I don't believe in the documentary hypothesis, and so I just read right over those words because I don't attribute them to that. Okay? I don't agree with everything Anderson says. I'm not going to defend it all to you. But he has a lot of good material as well, and he does stretch your mind on this stuff. He makes you, if nothing else, this book has given you a sense that theology can be a very serious and deep and intense study. It's all, not all sweetness and light if you decide to pursue this as a serious academic pursuit, okay, as an academic discipline. And that's good. You need to know that, that some of this is hard. And some of this requires real thought. And a lot of people who are doing this seriously in service to God are working hard at it. Okay? Whether we agree with what Anderson is saying necessarily or not. Okay? All right. Today we are continuing outline of the course. We are in week four, Theology of the Covenant. And today we are going to be talking about a number of the covenants uh, that God has given his people in the Old Testament. And first I want to start out with what does covenant mean? You will recall in our very first class when I was talking about the development of Old Testament theology, that Old Testament theology, because of the documentary hypothesis in the 19th century, because of the development in the first half of the 20th century of some other competing theologies, if you will, like process theology, others that just kind of made everybody feel like, what's the use? That's really what happened, is they were going, why even try? Because Everybody's telling us that, that there's no valid way to approach this, and you're not going to really get to anything other than studying it as history. Well, uh, the two men who really significantly, I believe, were responsible for bringing back Old Testament theology as a discipline of study were uh, Gerhard von Rad and Walter Eichrode. Each of them had a, their own approach to it. Walter Eichrode probably was, um, in a broader sense, von Rad is academically is, is very, very strong, very powerful, very important. Icro probably had a wider influence in terms of more people picking up on some of the ramifications of what he said because his whole focus was to center Old Testament theology and our understanding of what God did through the stories of the Old Testament around the theme or the topic of covenant. When we talked about this uh, at the first class, Carolyn and I were talking about it afterwards and her response was, well, of course, everybody knows that. You know, and, and that's, <laughs> that's what you said. You know, that, 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 uh, that's the obvious thing. Well, one of the reasons that seemed like such the obvious thing to us is that's an example of the fact that, that Ike Rowe's influence has been so comprehensive. And rightly so, because I think that is a good way to understand it. That if you had to pick one thematic kind of approach in which to understand the Old Testament, then Covenant is probably the best one you could pick. Um, in fact, toward the end of this class, I'm going to be talking about covenant theology, which goes back for quite a bit further than I wrote, but that he really kind of revived. Um, you will notice as I go through here, I'm not going to use the term covenant theology. I'm going to talk about theology of covenant, because covenant theology is a very specific thing. It means something very specific that I'm going to talk about at the end of the class. So as we talk about this, let's start with the question, what is a covenant? <laughs> Not a word that we use often, unless you're doing a lot of real estate deals, because they sometimes have covenants. Or if you, you know, if you belong to a fraccionamiento, there will be covenants that you agree to. A covenant is an agreement, usually a formal agreement, 
between two or more persons to do or not do something that is specified. So it's an agreement. It's a contract, if you will. That's what a covenant is. Now, in a biblical sense, there's a particular application. A biblical covenant is the conditional promises, usually conditional, we're going to talk about that, the conditional promises made to humanity by God as revealed in Scripture, or another way to say that, the agreement between God and the ancient Israelites in which God promised to protect and or bless them if they kept his law and were faithful to him. Okay? Um, biblical covenant. It means the agreements that God had with the Israelites, and there were several, that um, in which he said, here's your half the deal, this is what you have to do, and here's what I agree to do. That's the agreement part. That's the, uh, the covenant part. Now, the word that we translate as covenant, the Hebrew word is berit, which means to bond or to fetter, to bind something. It's translated into the Greek, as in the uh, Greek uh, Septuagint, as syntheke, which is to the binding together. You know, what it, in other words, it's a binding agreement. The translation uh, into Greek is either syntheke or diatheke. Diatheke is the word that's used for a will or a testament. That's why we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. <coughs> it's really the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Those words are interchangeable in that regard. And it's helpful for you to understand. We say New Testament, Old Testament all the time, and most people never think about what testament means. Well, it really means covenant. And in fact, in the book of Hebrews, there's a wonderful passage where it talks about how can there be a testament unless there was a testator, a person who died and left something, and that person was Jesus. So the book of Hebrews, which we believe was written by a woman, uh, Priscilla... <laughs> Um, we be our old pastor, Earl Palmer, and Carolyn's mother, Carolyn, and I. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that sometime. Anyway, in Hebrews, it talks about the fact that the testament and covenant, covenant is a good, is, testament is a good word for it, because it implies a testator, someone who, who has died and left a will, if you will. Now, in the Bible, then, a covenant is a relationship based upon mutual commitments, typically involving promises, obligations, and rituals. There, well, the rituals of circumcision, for instance, that's one of the elements of the Abrahamic covenant, is that uh, boys, first it was men, then boys have to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant. The term testament and covenant can be used interchangeably, though covenant usually is the one used to indicate the relationship between the Jews and God. Um, let me say one thing. When we talked about God being uh, the I am, that he is non-contingent, which means that he is not dependent upon anything, he does not rely on anything for his existence. We talked about that under the theology of God. Well, consistent with that understanding of God, it's important for us to start out under seeing that God was under no um, requirement to create the covenants that he created. It was not necessary for God to create these covenants. It's not like he was an equal partner and, you know, he was going to be sued if he didn't do it. In every one of the covenants that God established with his people, um, the Old Testament covenants and then the New Covenant we're going to talk about, is because he voluntarily chose to condescend or to accommodate himself in the establishing of a relationship with human beings via his covenant agreement. Covenants are a sign of God's love and grace because he, not having to, but choosing to participate in a relationship with his people under particular kinds of agreement terms, which are the covenants. Get that? Every covenant is a sign of God's mercy and grace to us because he didn't have to do it. All right? So, there... Um, I think it's also fair to say, and before I, I'm going to get into the types of, of biblical covenants, um, all of the covenants of the Bible really are various expressions of one eternal covenant. In every one of the agreements that God made with his people, the, the underlying value was, I will be your God and you will be my people. Now, at various times throughout the history of his relationship with the Israelites, and into the New Testament times as well, but I've promised in this class I'm going to focus on the Old Testament 
not get very much in the New Testament. We'll do that next term. Um, in every case, there are slightly different particulars written into it. But whatever the particulars are, some of them are unconditional, just free gift from God. Some of them are conditional, where for this, for this covenant to be honored, you people have to do certain things. Um, but all of them really are subsets of one eternal covenant, and that is God accommodating himself to us and saying, I want to be in relationship with you. Here are the terms that are acceptable to me for us to be able to work together. Here is my covenant. Right? But all of them are, are various expressions of the one covenant. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. And it's important for us to keep that in mind as we go along. Now, I believe there are three types of biblical covenants. These are not the same three types that Anderson uses. Anderson refers to them from their, their source uh, documentation. He talks about priestly covenants and Deuteronomistic covenants. I'm not going to go there. To me, the three covenants are based upon... In effect, what God is expecting of us in the process. The first kind of covenant, for which we really only have one good example, I think, is called a parody covenant. And by the way, if you have an NIV study Bible, there's a little chart on 20, page 23. I'm like a, I've got a chart I'm going to show you, too. Mine's not exactly the same, but some of the material is the same. Um, parody covenant was an agreement between equals, or those choosing to interact as equals, based on friendship and mutual respect. Purely that. In fact, again, the chart in the NIV Study Bible says that usually in Old Testament times, if somebody, uh, if two parties had a parity agreement or a parity covenant, they would refer to each other as brothers. They would refer to each other as equals. Well, there's only one good example of that, and you might be surprised for me to say, in, in my interpretation, that that is the agreement with um, Adam, that there is an uh, Adamic covenant, because God created Adam for relationship. And there was no other real expectation. We'll talk about the specifics of that. But there was a sense in which there was mutual respect. They walked together in the garden in the cool of the day, apparently. They were in relationship face to face. And God created Adam and then Eve in order to have a mutual respect and relationship. Not because he had to. That's why this says an agreement between equals or those choosing to interact as equals. God was, did not create Adam and Eve as being equal to himself. But he did create them and then treat them as basic equals by the description we have in Genesis. Right? That he wanted to be friends with Adam. And all was required was respect, which they didn't give him. Okay, we'll talk about the specifics of that. The second kind of covenant, I believe, is the royal grant covenant. This was a grant which was made by a king or other more senior party to a loyal servant. So there's clearly an inequity of status here, but the king or other senior uh, official would give a loyal servant some grant of land, of wealth, of freedoms, um, usually in return for faithful or exceptional service, but which was otherwise unconditional. This carried through all the way into medieval times, where kings who legally owned all the land, like the king of England owned all of England, but he would give a land grant to lords who agreed to serve him faithfully. That's, that royal grant idea has carried down since biblical times. And we see modern uh, equivalents of it. Then the third kind of covenant that we have is called the suzerain vassal covenant. This is one that I think that uh, Anderson does a pretty good job of presenting in his book. In the 20th century, Discoveries were made of other kinds of ancient documents, particularly in the Hittite empires, which would have been in modern, the area that's modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia Minor. In the Hittite empire, they had a kind of document agreement or covenant agreement called a suzerain vassal. And in it, it was a treaty agreement between the king, who is the suzerain, and his subjects, who were vassals. It was a conditional bilateral agreement in which the king would allow the subjects to prosper and to be protected in return for their loyalty and for their service. Now, we've been able to identify through archaeological means and historical means that there were six parts to those standard suzerain vassal treaties or agreements. There's a preamble, which identifies the parties involved. The second part is a review of what the past history and relationship has been between the two parties. 
The third level would be a statement of the positive future that's hoped for and expected, the future relationship being good. The fourth step, or, or part of it, is to identify the specific laws or the stipulations, what each party is going to be obligated to. The fourth part is invoking gods as witnesses. And the fifth part is to have sanctions of blessings or curses. If you do this, here's the good stuff that will happen to you. If you violate this agreement, here are the bad things. Now the interesting thing is that only in the 20th century did they find these suzerain vassal documents and they began to look at them and study them and then somebody realized this lines up exactly with the Mosaic Covenant or the Sinaitic Covenant as it's sometimes called, the covenant given to the Israelites through Moses. And of course so liberal scholars immediately jumped to the point of, oh well obviously this wasn't from God, they copied it from the Hittites. <laughs> well again, we're always too quick to, to completely jump off the boat on this kind of thing. What it meant was, remember that God accommodates himself to us. God speaks to us in language and in ways in which we can understand him. The fact that in that time, the Hittite Empire was, was powerful at the time of Moses. The, the fact that in that time, there was sort of a standard way of writing up an agreement, a covenant agreement, doesn't change the fact that God was involved in it. He put it in a form that would have been recognized and respected by the people that received it. If I'm going to write a letter to somebody, I, I don't, you know, if I want them to take it seriously, I probably will have a date, and I will have an inside address, and then I'll have a salutation, you know, you know, dear Bill, and then I'll have the body of the letter, and then I'll have some sort of closing, cordially or sincerely, Ross Arnold, and then I might have a PS, right? Why? Because that's the standard form that people understand and expect and receive well. If I were to, you know, write this thing on a hubcap in crayon and, you know, and, and don't address it to a particular person and they're going, is this for me or not? What the heck is this all about? But by putting it in a form that people understand and expect, then I get past all that and get to the real point. I believe that in the same way, the fact that there, were, uh, there was a model for the way that covenant agreements were written in the time that the Mosaic Covenant was done, God was accommodating himself to us and trying to keep the form from becoming a problem for anybody by using that as the outline form for the Mosaic Covenant. It in no way diminishes, the, in fact it reinforces the aspect of accommodation as a doctrine for how God interacts with us. Is that clear? Any questions about that? But we do have examples from archaeology and from history that this was a standard and quite common way for kings to relate to their lesser uh, vassals. All right. This chart, and of course all of this stuff is available to you online. You all know that. I, I, this was uploaded this morning because I had some changes I made to it this morning. Um, the, the, there are three primary covenants that the in Scripture, and the only three that Anderson really deals with are the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, and the Davidic Covenant. But I picked five, or six, excuse me, that I think are worth noting. Um, and I want to talk about each one of those one at a time. <clears throat> the first covenant that I would mention is the Adamic Covenant, or the covenant that God made with Adam. This is found in Genesis 2 and 3, and this is the only version or type of covenant that I believe really is a parody covenant. A parody meaning equal. God created Adam and Eve. He clearly wasn't their equal, but he chose to treat them like equals. That's why we have a passage where God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he calls out to Adam and Eve and says, where are you? This is after they've eaten of the apple, they've been aware of their nakedness, they've sinned against God, they've violated the only single thing he asked them not to do. And yet, he apparently has not been using his omniscient vision to see, to watch them, to, to spy on them, but rather, not only has given them free choice, but has given them freedom to live their lives without feeling like God, the all-seeing, all-powerful God, is paying attention to everything they do. It was an act of respect. And remember, the parity agreement is one in which mutual respect is the basis. Friendship, fellowship, mutual respect. I believe that fits here. It was only after Adam and Eve violated that mutual respect the only thing that God asked them to do, that problems arose. So, I believe it's a parody type covenant. The participants, obviously, Adam and Eve. Uh, and, and this covenant holds both pre and post fall. 
Again, I'm going to get into specifics of these in a minute. In terms of a description, the fellowship and provision that was given in the garden, God said, all of these trees are here for you to eat. You have everything you need. The only thing I want you to do, out of respect for me, is I'd like to ask you not to eat of that one tree. Otherwise, we're good. And I look forward to us having a lot of time together. Michael. Are we going back to a parity government in the end, in the culmination of time? Is that the idea, or even better? Is heaven going to be a parity kind of arrangement? Uh, to a great extent, yes. You know, when it talks about that he will be our God, we will be his people, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes, that he will be the light of the, you know, uh, to some extent. Now, he still, I think there's more of a sense in Revelation, which is where we have those pictures, of God being recognized as being God, and we're not. But still, he is going to treat us uh, in, in ways, fellowship is going to be the focus, less than obedience. And that's the definition of parody. Let me ask one question. John, it's not, I want to make sure that Michael's head is not getting in the camera. Is it? Well, stay where you are so I can see. I don't see it. No. Okay, we're good. I just want to make sure. Um, you're good. You're good. Um, uh, can I? Yes. Okay. I have to kind of disagree with you on the fact that. I'm shocked. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> of course, um, they're like dogs. So. Um, and the fact that God would not be all knowing in the fact that when he would say um, I didn't say he wasn't all knowing. I know but you just said I I feel like that you just said that he held back and when he said to uh, Adam, where are you? Right, and we have other places in scripture where that's done. Well, just like a parent asks a child um, when they already know that the child has done something wrong, the question what did you do? Right. To get them to confess. Right. Well, God says, where are you? God already knows where he is. I, I don't think, I don't read it that way. And because, again, there in, Phil, in Philippians we have the example of out of regard for us, out of God's grace for us, Jesus set aside his power. He did not claim or grasp, it says, his divinity, but rather set it aside for our sake. I believe the whole description of God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That doesn't sound like it's setting up for God to, you know, to confront these these children who have uh, defied Him. Now, it's possible to read it that way. I'm not disagreeing with that. Well, I have but, to disagree with you again because when Jesus came down, He made Himself man. But by God choice. is always God, and God is always on well, Jesus is God too, okay? He got he that's an down, example of God making down, looking. Yes, but he came down to the earth to make himself man. So okay. I disagree with you. I think okay, you're reading that wrong. With you, so there you okay. Go. Um, I the, the other covenants, and this chart is available for you to sort of have a summary of them. The Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah, and we're going to deal with these one at a time, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on the chart. Then the Abrahamic covenant really happens in two phases. Uh, there is uh, the, and you'll notice that the Noah covenant, I believe, is a royal grant covenant where it is just a, a gift from God to a servant. The first part of the Abrahamic covenant is a royal grant. It's where God says to Abraham, um, if you'll agree to be my person, then I will give you all of this blessing. And if you agree with that, then come on, follow me or go where I'm sending you. Right? But there's actually not a condition there. And then later there is a slightly a variation to that where it becomes much more of a suzerain vassal kind of agreement where God says, all right, yes, I will make you a great nation. I will, um, you know, you will have many descendants. You will be the father of many nations. This is when Abraham's chain name becomes Abraham and not Abram. Um, the, uh, he then is told, you will have not only many descendants, but I will give you a promised land that you can live in, the land of Canaan. But to, to receive all of that, and he also says, I will bless all peoples through you, but to receive all of that, you must obey me, and you must have all of your boys, your males circumcised as a sign of our covenant. So there are requirements then. All right. The um, Abrahamic or Sinaitic covenant, um, I use Sinaitic because that's what's used like in the NIV Bible in their charts and stuff. I prefer Mosaic covenant because everybody understands that it was given through Moses. It is again a conditional covenant, a suzerain vassal covenant to all the Israelites, but as descendants of Abraham. After the Abrahamic covenant, every other covenant that's given to the Israelites, uh, to the people of Israel, 
are sort of re-establishing of the covenant to Abraham. Because Abraham was the father of the Hebrew nation. The initial promise to the Hebrew nation was given to Abraham. And so the Mosaic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, even the New Covenant really were reaffirmations with various you know, particulars added of that Abrahamic Covenant. So the Mosaic Covenant is a conditional promise of land and blessing given to the Israelites that they would have a promised land, they would be blessed, but they had to obey the law which was given under Moses. He gave them very specific rules and they had to worship him faithfully, neither one of which they did very well. Then you have the Davidic Covenant. The, um, the Grant Covenant is a royal Grant Covenant that God gives to David. It starts when God sends Samuel to anoint David without any requirements. David doesn't have, he's a young man, uh, practically a boy, doesn't have to agree to anything. Then later, toward the end of David's life, God restates, remember I called you up out of nothing when you were herding sheep and made you king, and now I promise you, because of your faithfulness, even though you've committed a sin, Two sins, two big sins. He says, because of your faithfulness to me, I promise you that your son will sit on your throne and that I will create a dynasty from now on. Your name will be great. Everyone will look back to you as the great King David. That was a royal grant. David didn't have to do anything to meet the requirements. He didn't have any conditions on his side. Then God restates that covenant with Solomon, but in that case, he puts some requirements on it. And I think it's because he knew Solomon's heart. That even though Solomon started out right, asking for wisdom and not power or money or whatever, he says to Solomon, God says to Solomon, I will bless you, you will sit on this throne, you will, you will not have anybody challenging you, you will have a wonderful reign, and it will pass on to your descendants um, as long. Now he promised David that Solomon would sit there, his whole, he'd be on the throne his whole life. God reaffirms that. He says, and if you obey me and do not worship other gods, then your descendants will sit on this throne. If. That's the condition. Actually, Solomon violated that. He broke that. He set up uh, places to worship other gods because his, his foreign wives prompted him to do that. And that's why, upon Solomon's death, which fulfilled the promise that he'd given to David and to Solomon, then the kingdom was split in half. Um, and then you have the New Covenant, which is in Jeremiah 31, which is a royal grant covenant given to all of Israel and to all others who would accept. From Abraham uh, to Abraham's descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob's son Joseph, when, they, when God reestablished the covenant, he always said, and I will bless all people through you. So, and that's unconditional. Now, I want to look at those one at a time. Any questions about any of that? Uh, just a just a just... You know this is online. Carol. The, the New Covenant meaning not like the New Testament New Covenant, though. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, the New Covenant was established in Jeremiah huh. as being the covenant I will write on your hearts and in your minds. And it will be, no matter, it's unconditional. No matter what you do, I will love you and I will forgive you and I will give grace to you. That is seen as a prophetic announcement regarding the new covenant being fulfilled in Jesus Christ, which is really the bridge between, the new covenant is the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament covenant theology. Okay? But don't you have to do something in asking for forgiveness? Um, we'll talk about that. <laughs> the answer is no, you don't. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. All you can do is receive it. Now, you could not receive it. You can refuse it. But um, the, the idea that when works to actually go looking for salvation and asking for it is, would be a work. That would be, that would be an act on your part to try to get salvation. In effect, it is when God, by the Holy Spirit, places it in your heart, then all you can do is either say yes or no. But you can't go looking for it. That's why people many, many times in the past when I was teaching classes would come to me and say, I have a relative, I have you know, a sister, a brother, a mother, an aunt who's not saved, and I have to get them saved. What can I do to get them saved? Okay, and the answer is nothing. There's nothing you can do that will save them. There's nothing they can do to save them other than say yes. Now what you can do, I mean, that doesn't mean you sit helpless. You can't save them, but you can pray for them. You can be available to them. You can love them. 
You can be prepared to talk with them if the question comes up about what your faith is, what your belief is. But it's only when God the Holy Spirit places the desire in our hearts that we have the choice of saying yes or no. But you can't go out looking for it. So, okay? so you're saying that if he doesn't place it in our hearts, then we have no choice. That's correct. <coughs> so is well, that predestination? Let me, let me, the doctrine let me, of election. Let me say something here. That to me, when I, when I hear that, causes me to rejoice. <laughs> rejoice that He did that in me and gave me life, you know. And so instead of, you know, I, 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 the tendency I think is to try to judge His motives when maybe the best response is to say, Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You did that which I couldn't do for myself in right. me. And that's just... It's also true that... I said that I'm going to be talking about theology of covenant, and then at the end I'm going to talk about covenant theology, because covenant theology means something very specific. Covenant theology was actually developed significantly to help us understand or, or bring together what is a paradox. Paradox isn't a contradiction. A paradox is when two things that don't seem to be consistent are still both true. The paradox that God, Scripture says, that God desires that all be saved, that everyone comes with saving knowledge. But on the other hand, it also says, you know, read the first chapter of Ephesians, that God has, has elected some, that He has predestined some, that He puts that desire in people's hearts. Covenant theology was actually a theology that developed under Calvin more than anybody else. You know, and ours is a Calvinist theology, ours is a Reformed theology, in order to try to understand how both of those things are true. I don't know, nor does anybody know, if it fully accurately does that, but it's an, exactly an attempt to try to address that challenge and that, that thing that's difficult for us to accept we, and we can't claim we understand it all okay let's get started on talking about the covenants the first one I want to talk about is the Adamic covenant or the covenant with Adam and this actually to some extent can, can be considered a covenant of creation I know in Anderson's book he talks a lot about the Noahic covenant as being related to the covenant of creation but that's because he sort of skips over the, the Adam as being a covenant agreement, I think. I don't disagree with the fact that there's a, there's a covenant creation aspect of the Noah covenant. Anyway, this is my sort of statement of it here. When God created Adam and Eve, there was an implied covenant in the very act of creation. Remember, a covenant is when two parties agree, I'll do this and you do that. We each have something to do and in the process we have an agreement over it. Okay. So, the very act of creation is an implied covenant because in it, God made the cosmos, that was his part, in return for the fact that cosmos were intended to give him glory. So, there were two halves that kind of met in the middle in terms of an agreement for, for creation. There's an implied covenant in creation itself. But then, when Adam and Eve were created, they were provided completely for in the Garden of Eden. God said, here's everything you need. All right, all these animals, you name them. They're your animals. You've got more pets than you can shake a stick at. You've got all the food you need. It's, all you have to do is pick it off the tree. Everything was provided. And Adam and Eve were given authority over the whole rest of creation. What we would call, in theological terms, federal headship. You know, that he was the chief executive officer, if you will, over all creation at that point. Then, and all that was expected was that they have fellowship with God and that there be a sense of mutual respect. They literally were fellowshipping face to face. Not that they were equal. God was still the non-created God who made everything, including Adam and Eve. But he chose to accommodate himself literally to be face to face in a relationship with them. Okay? Then after the rebellion against God, when they denied the only real particular of this, which was mutual respect, then um, there was, in addition to all the other blessings of the covenant, the, the, the new part of the covenant, which continued but got modified after the betrayal of the fall, was a limitation on judgment and punishment. You know, we have the aspect in which God says to the woman, here's what punishment you're going to receive for what you did. Adam, here's what punishment you're going to receive. You remember, for the woman, you and the snake are never going to get along. You will bear children in pain from now on. And for the man, you will, and, and you, the husband will be head over you. And for the man, you uh, will eat bread by the sweat of your brow. It, 
The earth will be reluctant to give up what you need to live on. It's going to be hard work from now on. It's not just all going to be given to you. Those were the punishments and the introduction of death. But the point is, you would have expected that at the point of creation, the punishment would have been annihilation. Okay. You did it now. The whole reason why I put you here, you messed it up. So let me, let me try again. Okay, let me start again. That's not what God did. There was punishment involved, but it, in effect, it, it constituted an almost corporal punishment rather than annihilation, which is what probably would have been called for. Because they were told, the minute you eat of that one tree that I told you not to, then death is going to come in. And death did come in, but it was not immediate. They still lived long lives before death took them. And they were cast out of the garden. And they even were provided for after the fall. As I've talked about before, the first thing that God gives Adam and Eve after their betrayal, they had realized they were naked. They were ashamed. They were ashamed. And so they, they made garments out of leaves to cover themselves. The first thing that God does after he pronounces the judgment against them is he gives them clothes made out of the skins of animals. Now, the introduction of death into the, you know, into the animal world at that point, the, uh, another thing which which I thought about when I was preparing this, and I've never spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I want to spend some more time uh, about it. I've always had a little question in my mind, well, why the, you know, I understand the shedding of blood is necessary for the remission of sins, and I understand all the theological talk and, you know, elsewhere. But I never made the association before that the first thing that happened because of the sin of Adam and Eve was that animals had to shed their blood. Animals were killed. To a great extent, that was the first sacrifice because of sin. And so, in a way, everything after that, in terms of the whole ritual sacrifice for the atonement for sin in the Old Testament system, was an echoing of that very first thing that God did in response to the sin of Adam and Eve, which was to provide for them. It was a grace, actually, for Adam and Eve that the animals were killed. But still, the shedding of blood of an animal was the first thing that was done in response to sin, and then that continues to be echoed through the, the sacrificial atonement system of the Old Testament up until the one Paschal Lamb, once for all, in Jesus Christ, okay? So that's the Adamic covenant, rooted in the, the covenant aspects that are implied in creation, and then, in terms of God's initial agreement with Adam and Eve, pre-fall, and then his provision for them after the fall. Okay, because they are still his beloved creatures, even when they betray him. Let me give you two scripture verses related to that. The first one, in Genesis 2, this is where God sets up, if you will, the covenant with Adam and Eve, with Adam at this point. Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden. This is Genesis 2, starting with the 8th verse. And there he put the man he had formed. God provided by giving him a garden to live in. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Only one thing. I want you to respect me by doing one thing for me, and everything else is permissible. Or not do one thing for me, and everything else is permissible. Then they violate... The respect of God, they betray the love of God by doing that one thing they weren't supposed to. And we get to Genesis 3. Uh, this is after they've eaten and God has, has uh, appeared. There's the recognition of what they've done. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So there is punishment in response to violating the covenant agreement that God had with Adam and Eve. 
and, and all, of, all that he had provided for them. And yet it is not, it's conditional. God limits the punishment as part of his agreement with them. And he even then provides for them. All right? Any questions about that? Questions or comments? Like comment. Please. This, this, you said something a minute ago that just really got me. This, you know, when, when, he, when he sacrificed the animals to cover Adam and Eve, there's no indication that Adam and Eve even repented. It was all grace. Right. Yeah, the only thing we have them saying is Adam trying to blame well, the woman and blaming God for sending her there. Okay. But we have no, there's no record of them falling on their face, accepting responsibility, apologizing. So there is still grace. There is still God uh, fulfilling his side of the covenant despite the punishment. Even so. Okay, Jeanette. Uh, Adam named his wife Eve because. Right. I don't understand the explanation of because. Well, the, the name Eve, um, you have one of the study Bibles. So why don't you look up and see what it says. Eve probably means living. That's one of the little footnote things that you'll get. Living? Living. Which means, or Eve means life or mother of life. She is going to be the mother of many. And so that name, the word that is Eve, means to the living, to produce the living. Okay. First Bill and then Sierra. I was just going to say, it was then the grandson, Enosh, that first began to call on the name of the Lord after this. Right. We don't have any record of that until Enoch, that we do know that he was, he was righteous. Okay. Um, and then you know, Noah was righteous as well. Well, they didn't know what was coming they well they didn't they didn't fall down and, and say oh I'm, I did wrong they didn't know what was coming yeah they were the first ones to experience this for sure <laughs> um, absolutely no so but they knew it was wrong and they knew yeah. they violated his love and trust and so still you would have thought there was some sense in which they were sorry for it they were ashamed but they don't express sorrow or apology so. Sierra, I skipped over you. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, what? Why was Eve named after this? Why does she not have a name until way down here? Well, she had uh, uh, the way the, the way the story is laid out for us is she had just appeared immediately as a helper, and you know that God, the scene where God takes Adam's rib and makes a helpmate for him because there was not a not an appropriate helper for him amongst all the animals. Um, that is immediately before, that's the end of chapter 2, that's immediately before the Eve is tempted by the snake. So the sense we get is that this was like, she shows up on Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning the snake shows up and tempts her into this and there hasn't been a whole lot of time to talk about stuff between the two. I mean, I'm being a little facetious there, but we're, this is a sort of, you know, one, two, three, four, five kind of sequence of things so that there was not a lot going on. Or it may have, you know, it may have been... Um, you know, he was just saying, hey, you, up until that point, said, well, that's not going to work. We need to come up with a better name than that. Yeah, so and then, then he couldn't spell it. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. The Lord to told Adam not to, to, not to uh, take anything from that tree. Eve didn't exist then. But she knew, because she quoted exactly back to, to but so apparently Adam would have communicated to her, okay, here are the rules. You know. We can do, all of this is for us, the animals are ours, everything's good. There's just one rule. You can't eat from that tree. And, and, and it's Eve that quotes that back to the devil. So it's not like she had any excuse that she was confused about the, about the, the arrangements. So, okay. All right, let's go on to the second covenant, which is the Noahic covenant. Uh, the covenant with Noah. We are still in the, the, prim, the, the primeval uh, prehistory time here. The Noah Covenant be begins first with God's special provision for Noah and his family in return for their righteousness. Now, there's not a stated covenant, but there, again, there's an implied covenant. God comes to them and says, because the whole world is so corrupt and so evil and there's so many bad things going on, but you, Noah, and your family are good, I'm going to save you, but I'm going to get rid of the rest of these folks. So there was a sense in which this is kind of a royal grant sort of thing in response to Noah's obedience and righteousness. So we have the flood. 
and God destroys all except for Noah and his family and the animals that are on the flood. And then there is the particulars of the Noah covenant, which occur after the flood, particulars being the stated particulars, where God promises that he will continue to bless and prosper and protect Noah and his family, his sons and, and uh, extended family. God also, at that point, makes the unconditional covenant promise to every living creature, and that's the way he says it. I'm going to read you the verses here. To never again destroy all of the earth. And then the second statement time he says it, he says to destroy all the earth with water from the flood. Okay. And then, as you, I'm sure you know the story, God says as a sign, a binding, uh, forever sign of my promise in this covenant, I give you the rainbow. That whenever it rains, you will have a rainbow as a sign of my covenant. That's where rainbows come from. Okay. You knew that, right? Uh, Reagan Bogan is a friend of mine who used to call him. Um, the two passages I want to read you here, uh, well, it's one long passage, from Genesis 8, starting with the 20th verse and going into chapter 9. Then Noah built an ark to the Lord, and, and this is after all the instructions and whatnot, and taking ark. some of the... Yes? An ark? Ark. Oh. I'm sorry, an altar. This is after the ark. Uh, the, the flood has already occurred. You're absolutely right. I'm... I'm reading with my brain instead of my eyes. <laughs> then Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is after the ark has landed and they've all recovered from that. Um, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of human beings, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all of the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on all the fish in the seas. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that still that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of if, of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood. By human beings shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made humankind. And continuing, as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. This is the Noahic covenant. For Noah and his family, it says that his sons, because it was patriarchal, but it's you know their their wives and their children, and then with them as being sort of the federal headship of creation at this point, with all living creatures that God promises He will never again do the destruction that He did in the Noah covenant. Mm -hmm. Questions about that or comments? Okay, those two, the Abrahamic and Noahic are kind of preliminary covenants. Now we get into what are considered the three major covenants of the um, Old Testament. Before we do that, it is one minute till two. Let's take a break. We will come back together, let's say, nine minutes after. I'll give you a ten-minute break. Right.
I just turned it off. There you go. Okay, let's start again. <laughs> um, the Abrahamic covenant really occurs in two stages. First, Abram, remember his name gets changed. There are several things that, that happen on a fairly regular basis when a covenant is established. One of them is there sometimes is a ritual event, like circumcision, we're going to talk about in a minute. Sometimes people's names get changed as a sign of the fact that a significant occurrence, a change in their life because of a covenant with God has occurred. So originally, his name was Abram. God appears to Abram when he lived in the land of Ur, which is Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, and said, I want to make you my, my God. I want you to be the father of my people. I will make you uh, the father of a great nation. Um, so come with me. And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, as it says later. And God called him to go first to Haran, which was in a, a north northwestern part of Mesopotamia, later down into Canaan, um, and then um, to Egypt a little bit, and then back again. But the point is that Abraham was following God. That was the first great call. It was fairly simple. I want to do these things for you. I want to make this promise to you. If that sounds good to you, then come with me. It really was unconditional in that regard. God didn't say to Abraham at that point, here's what you have to do. God said, I want to do these things for you, and I promise to do these things for you if you'll come along with me. And Abraham said, yeah, I believe you, and I'll do it. Okay. The second stage then becomes more specific. God promises Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son. Particularly, God promises that Abraham would have descendants through a son that would be born to, to Sarah, whose name up until this point had been Sarai. Now, Abraham already has a son, Ishmael, by Hagar, who is the handmaiden of Sarah. And so Abraham, since God had promised him earlier, 10 years earlier, that he was going to make him a great people, Abraham had sort of you know, gotten impatient, as Sarah did. And so they have a son through Hagar, or Abraham has a son through Hagar, Ishmael. And God thinks, well, it's Ishmael that's going to be my, the father, you know, the one through whom we have many descendants. But God comes to him and says, no, it's not Ishmael. I'm going to take care of him. Twelve different tribes of people will come from him. But I'm going to give you a son from Sarah, even though you're now 99 years old. And you're going to have a son. And to prove this to you, or to demonstrate this to you, I'm going to change your name. Your name will no longer be Abram. It will now be Abraham, which means the father of many. Abram means honored father. Abraham means father of many. To officially declare that he would be the father of many nations. And that the, additionally, Abraham is told that he will, um, his descendants will inherit Canaan as a promised homeland. That God would give him all of Canaan for his descendants. And the part I don't have up here is that he also said, and I will bless all nations of the earth through you. And then when God reaffirms the Abrahamic covenant to Isaac, Abraham's son, he includes, and I will bless all peoples of the earth through you. And then when God reaffirms that same covenant through Jacob, Isaac's son, he says, and I will bless all the people of the earth through you. So God restates that each time. This Abrahamic covenant, from this point on, becomes the foundational covenant, and all the other covenants to follow with the Hebrew people are really reiterations of this great Abrahamic covenant, the promise to Abraham. Because everyone else for wh with whom God has a covenant after this are all descendants of Abraham. So they're restating this covenant from then on. Let me give you the verses related to this. I've mean, got three passages I want you to see. From Genesis 12, the first four verses, this is the call to Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, or not to Abraham, to Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Simple as that. God said, I'm going to be a blessing to you. I will bless you. Um, all peoples on earth through you, um, I will make your name great, come with me. And Abraham went. The second passage, three chapters later, in Genesis 15, is where it gets a little more specific. 
Again, Abram, Abram had thought since Ishmael was a son born of Hagar, they didn't have any children, he didn't have any children through Sarah, that Ishmael was the one that was going to be it. And we find, starting with verse 4, chapter 15, Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man, Ishmael, will not be your heir, but a son coming for your, from your own body will be your heir. He meant a son that's yet to come from your own body. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. There's a great song. Um, look up at the star. Look at the stars, Abraham. Um, that, to look at the stars and say, That's how many your descendants will be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him his righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. And then a third reiteration of the covenant to Abraham is in Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. See, here we're actually putting it in terms of covenant. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Remember, all of these are basically, I will be your God and you will be my people. It's reflected, the, all of these reflect that basic truth. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. So previously, God had just said, I'll be your God, you'll be my guy, I will bless you. Now, when God starts talking specifics of covenant, he says, let's nail this down. You are to be obedient to me, and I will bless you and make you great, and as a sign of that covenant, Every male has to be circumcised. From this point on, circumcision was, well, from this point forever, circumcision was the sign of being a, a Jew. You know, that's the sign of being one of the Hebrew, one of the Israelites, a follower of God. After Moses, there's a second observation that becomes the second sign of being Jewish, and that is the observation of the Sabbath. From Moses' time on, the two marks that set someone aside as being Jewish was to be circumcised, and not for medical reasons like we do in modern days, but to be circumcised in obedience to God, and secondly, to observe the Sabbath. Those became the two real marks of somebody being an observant Jew. Okay? Yes? Uh, Abraham was Abraham. Right. And he became Abram. No, other way around. He started as Abram and then became Abraham. Okay? Abram means exalted father. And, and so he had that name, which was honorific. But then when God said, you are going to have a lot of children, even though you're 99, you, you don't believe me. And so I'm going to, to sort of uh, establish this as my agreement with you, I'm going to change your name. You're not going to be called Abraham. Which means exalted, or means father of many. Okay. What's that? No, his name after that was Abraham. He was no longer called Abram. They stopped calling him Abram, and after that, he was Abraham. Okay. Other questions? This really does become the foundational covenant from this point on, and everything else becomes a reaffirming or reiteration of this. It's been rightly said that the Old Testament. It could be defined as the story of God's covenant relationship with his people. And that's why covenant is a theme that it recurs from Adam all the way through to the prophet Jeremiah, which was one of the very last prophets. Um, and the major covenants in between with the three major figures of the Old Testament 
Abraham, then Moses, and then David. Okay? Alright, the next covenant, the one that most people think about when they think of covenant, in fact, is the Mosaic covenant, because it's the one that had the most details to it, and the one that affected the ordinary people more. Remember now, after the covenant with Abraham, Abraham has the son Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has 12 children, who become the 12 tribes of Israel, and all of a sudden you're getting a passel of folk. The, the um, statement, and I think it's in Anderson, is that there are three things that God needed to do for, for the, the children of Abraham in order to fulfill his promise. One was make them a people, so it wasn't just Abraham and, and Sarah. The second, which he did, and the second was to give him a law, which is a constitution, how do you want me to live, God? And the third was to give them a land. The second one happens here. Abraham was made a, a people. Moses is given the law. So the Mosaic Covenant, which is also called the Sinaitic Covenant because it was given at Mount Sinai in the Sinai Desert, follows the great redemption of the Hebrew people when God brought them up out of slavery in Egypt. In fact, all the way through after Moses, after the, you know, the Exodus, when they, the people come up out of Egypt, God will be described as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God who brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. That's how God is described from then on. So this great uh, redemptive act of bringing them up out of slavery in Egypt. It is, the Mosaic Covenant is a conditional promise to make the Israelites as a whole God's own treasured people. Now he had promised Abraham that he would bless his descendants. But from Abraham there were other Descendants. Ishmael, for instance, his son by Hagar, became the father of the Arabic peoples. Okay, and so you get different, different. Now, this is a particular line, the line that came through Isaac and to Jacob, and then from the twelve children of Jacob. So there were other descendants of Abraham, but this at this point God sharpens the point so that it is only the descendants of Jacob or Israel of the 12 tribes of Jacob, that God is saying, you will be my special covenant people. So it's a conditional promise to make the Israelites, those 12 tribes, the descendants of the 12 tribes, God's own treasured people to go ahead of them to defeat their enemies so that they can take possession of the promised land as a sign of God's covenant promise and commitment that he made to Abraham. Remember, he promised Abraham, I will give your descendants this land of Canaan as their inheritance. So the Mosaic Covenant is a, is a reaffirming of that original Abrahamic Covenant. In return, the Israelites are told that they must worship only Yahweh God and no other gods. The Ten Commandments are sort of the, the pinnacle of this covenant. And it starts out, you know, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of slavery in Egypt and you will have no other gods before me. That's one. And two is, you shall not make for yourself any idols, neither idols of things on the earth, nor things in the heaven above, nor things in the sea below, nor shall you worship them. Okay? So, this is establishing some particulars that had not existed before. Um, because previous to this, the Israelites were probably henotheistic. We've talked about that. They probably recognized from Abram's time uh, on that there was one great God that we worship, but there were other deities too. The household gods, the teraphim. Here, in the Mosaic Covenant, God says, you will have no other gods before me, and in fact, you will have no other gods at all. And then he goes on. You will respect my name. You will honor the Sabbath. You will honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't steal. Um, uh, don't bear false witness. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. Those are the rules. And then, after that, in Exodus 20, you get the... the those big ten rules are turned into more specifics. And so the law is more than just those ten, but those ten are the high point of it. All right? So the Israelites must worship only Yahweh God, no other gods, and they must obey all of the law which God gives them through Moses. Now, note, and this was a question you asked the other day, Ron. The Palestinian covenant, that term is used sometimes, Anderson uses it. The Palestinian covenant is the promise of the promised land. You know, the promise behind, the promised land. And particularly it refers to um, the 29th chapter of Deuteronomy. Remember the, the, the law was first given at Mount Sinai, and then the Israelites wandered around the desert for 40 years. 
After all of the adult males except Caleb and Joshua had died out and they were ready to move into the promised land, God gives them the law again. That's what Deuteronomy means. It's the second telling of the law. And when he tells them the law again, he reaffirms his covenant promise to give them the promised land. To give them the land of Palestine as a homeland. That's in Deuteronomy 29. But God goes further in Deuteronomy 30 and he says, not only that, not only will I give you this as your homeland now when you cross over the Jordan here, as you're getting ready to do that, they were in Moab when this is done, which is right on the east side of the Jordan River. But he says that in the future, when you are scattered to nations all over the world, I will return you then to this place, and this will be your homeland forever. So Deuteronomy 29 and 30 is the Palestinian covenant, which promises the, the land of Canaan as a homeland for the Jews, not only under Joshua when they entered in to conquer it, but there's the promise in Deuteronomy 30 that this will be in the future, even if they get scattered around the world, the diaspora, as it's called, the spreading out, that they will eventually be called back. Um, some work I was doing just the other day, there are now, um, the expectation is that by uh, 2020, there will be more Jews living inside the nation of Israel than outside the nation of Israel. Just a few years ago, nobody thought that would be possible. The rate of return of Jewish people into the nation, of, into Israel, the country of Israel, is astonishing. It shocked everybody. Nobody thought that many Jewish people would claim the right of return and come back there. And that is actually accelerating. More and more are coming back. Um, and so the idea of God would eventually call the Jewish people back to Israel, to, to Palestine, to Canaan, is, is actually taking place. All right? So beginning to see a, a 21st century fulfillment of the 14th century BC promise. Okay? Questions about that? Isn't there a huge population of, of Jews in the United States? It used to be that New York City was the largest population of Jews in the world. It's not a, the largest anymore. Tel Aviv is. Um, and so, uh, in fact, I think New York is third now. And uh, the cities in Israel are growing significantly, and a large portion of that are uh, people who are, who are claiming the right of return. Any Jewish person around the world who is of Jewish heritage is allowed to return. The only exception is they won't allow Jews who have converted to Christianity, even if they are of Jewish heritage. Um, that's uh, a ruling a few years ago. But um, yeah, the, New York is no longer the largest population of Jews in the world. Ron? Just clarifying, did you say they cannot be Christian? If they have said that for a person who is a Jewish person, meaning they, their heritage is Jewish, you know, Jewish is defined in two ways. It is a biological thing, you know, that my, I come from a line of people of Jewish heritage, but it's also a religious, you know, that you can be, become a Jew, even if you don't, even if you come from Gentile parents, you can become a Jew if you convert to the religion. Well, the law, the law of return in Israel, once it was reestablished in the 1940s, they have a law of the right of return that says that anyone who is Jewish can come back and become a citizen of Israel. And you don't have to, you know, you, there are no other restrictions if you can show that you are of Jewish heritage. But then they decided that they were getting Jews who had, who had converted to Christianity coming back and they were evangelizing. And so they passed a new law that said the exception to the right of return is that Jews who have become Christians are not allowed back in. Um, wow. So, at least not, it's not automatic at least. So does that include... The Messianic Jews? Messianic Jews, Messianic yes. Exactly. That's exactly who that is. Okay. Yeah, that's who that's targeted at. And I know that because one of my clients is Jews for Jesus. And they have people who are who have tried to, you know, claim the right of return and have been refused. Because they still have all the customs and everything. They still do everything, right? Um, I have a friend that's a Messianic. Well, there's, there's different kinds of Messianic Jews. Um, some Messianic Jews actually feel an obligation to still follow the laws. Um, which I think is wrong. Right. And the Messianic Jews that I know follow the traditions and the historical patterns and celebrate, you know, as Jewish people, but not because they think that is required, but because that's part of their culture and heritage. But they, for instance, don't feel like they have to do that in order to be forgiven because they're forgiven by Jesus, by the right. blood of Christ, whom they believe in. Okay. But there are some Messianic Jews who are sort of like the Judaizers that Paul was fighting in the New Testament who say, well, yeah, you can believe in Jesus, but you still have to be circumcised, and you can't eat pork, and you have to do all those things, and if you violate those, then you're in trouble. That's, I think Paul made a pretty clear point about that. Right. So, okay? 
So, the Mosaic Covenant. Let me give you some of the verses. Uh, Exodus 19. Then Moses, this is right before Exodus 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are given and read. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Remember, Israel is another name for Jacob. So the house of Jacob and the nation of Israel, or people of Israel, is that's, that's, that's said twice for emphasis. It means the same thing. The house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. And of course, while he's back up on the mountain telling them all that the people agreed to it, they're all worshiping golden calves. But then we go to um, Exodus 23. God says, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way to bring you to the place I have prepared. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God, and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will give into your hands the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me because the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. So the Mosaic Covenant was you have to obey these laws I've given you and you have to worship me only as your God. And part of that is you need, you have to get rid of all these people that you're going to conquer in Canaan because if you don't, you will be tempted to follow their gods. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Because they didn't uh, proceed, they didn't pursue, as far as God told them to, the conquest of the land and the, and the killing or driving off of the people. Yes? Oh, okay. Uh, but this is the Mosaic Covenant, and this is where the Mosaic Law, the Hebrew Law, comes from. That is the law that the, that the Jews followed from this time to, well, to righteous Jews even today. Okay, Michael? And their land has never come really close politically to the Euphrates River, has it? No. Not yet. The Israelites have never fully claimed all of the land that was promised to them. The closest they've gotten was under Solomon. David conquered much of the land up into the sort of northwestern part of Mesopotamia, Haran, for instance, which is where Abraham first went to before he came down into Canaan. Um, and a little bit more Solomon got in by political negotiation, uh, just being astute about that stuff. But that's the most they've ever gotten. The total extent of the land that God had promised, the Israelites had never, have never known that. Because you think they, you think they will? Um, well, it was promised to them, and God says in Jeremiah 31 that he will, well, in Deuteronomy 30 and Jeremiah 31 and other places, that he will ultimately fulfill his obligation to the Jews and fulfill that covenant, whether they deserve it or not, even if they are unrighteous. That's the new covenant part. Wow. Okay, even if they have not, haven't done now. I'd be very careful about drawing too close a distinction or too close an association between uh, the nation of Israel as the people of God and the nation of Israel as the 21st century geopolitical entity. People who are rabidly pro-Israel because they think that's biblical. The nation of Israel today, uh, as it exists, is um, a secular nation. You know, if, if God judged the Israelites for not being obedient to him and worshiping him rightly in the past, what makes us believe that everything that they do today as a secular nation is right? You know, the nation of Israel is blessed by God. The, the Hebrew people are still God's chosen people. They are still the apple of his eye. In fact, we were adopted into that, we were grafted onto that plant. It's because of his promise to, to them that Jesus came. And we 
were then allowed to be adopted because of the promise that was given through Abraham to bless all nations, okay? Um, but people today think that anything the nation of Israel today does has to be right because they are the chosen people of God. They are not. The geopolitical nation of Israel today is not to be directly associated with being the people, with being God's chosen people. Right? Dave? Well, I've always been taught in the Baptist Church that God is a God of compassion. Mm -hmm. He's also a God of judgment. This is a very bloodthirsty type thing. They're smiting and smoking. And yep. He's also I mean, the blood's well like water. <laughs> yeah. Have we not talked about that in this class before? Or is this is the survey class we've talked about. Okay. There are several reasons why. Well, first let me say there is no explanation that sounds right to our 21st century Western ears as to why the conquest of Canaan was as bloody as it is. Okay, just a second. Um, there's, there's no way for me to describe this in a way you're going to go, oh, okay, that's fine, because it sounds awfully bloody. But there's several things we need to realize. First, to me, one of the most important things is the people of Canaan were horrendous people that deserved judgment by anybody's standards. These people had horrific religious practices, and we have evidence from them, not just from Scripture, but from, from other things. The sacrifice of their children to be burned alive to gods like Chemosh and, and Molech and others, which were some of the gods not only that the Canaanites followed, but just like God promised, that the Israelites started following. Solomon set up, um, Scripture tells us, 1 Kings tells us, that Solomon set up places of worship for Chemosh and Molech, both of whom demanded child sacrifice right outside the walls of Jerusalem. He set those up because of his wives. Um, Molech was the Moabite god. Uh, Chemosh was the Ammonite god. They, if ever there was, you know, and God said, wipe them out both for what they're doing and because if you don't, you're going to start doing that too. They didn't wipe them out, and that's what happened. And so the infants in Israel were being sacrificed to the flames. So that's one thing. Second thing, there was a very, we, we talk about accommodation, that God over time makes himself, um, presents himself to us, communicates to us in ways we can understand. Well, that works in reverse too. Uh, 3,400 years ago, one of the clear beliefs that people had was that uh, the God, if an army won, their God was more powerful. And the extent to which an army won, you know, if it was an absolute annihilation of the other people, then that God must truly be the great God. And so there was an extent to which the representation of God as the, as the only true, all-powerful creator of God would only have been accepted if the process by which victory came to the Israelites was absolute. Not qualified, but absolute. A third reason is, and we see, we see that historically, the fact the Israelites didn't do everything God told them to. They left, they left people un, you know, unattacked, un, annihilated, whatever you want to say, continued to be a problem for them from then on. Now, none of that still makes it sound okay to our Western ears. And the ultimate thing we fall back on is the same thing that, that God said to Job, and that is, excuse me, but who's God here? Were you there when I stretched out the heavens? Are you aware of, you know, it was God who made those peoples. Only God is righteous in deciding what's to happen to them. We are not, and we can't even fully understand that. And that's not a compound. That's a confession. We don't understand how that works, but we can have a perspective on it that I think gives us a little bit more understanding of it. First back here, Ron. Uh, Mary pointed out to me in our NIV study Bible, an excellent one page. There's an article in there. Article that you mentioned in it just about says the same thing about our culture being offended by this. Yeah. And that's why it was written. If you have the NIV study Bible, it's the, like the first article in there, it's 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 right at the front of Genesis or whatever. Turn to the turn to the indices and it will have the list of articles and stuff, and it's got the article on the idea of the Canaanite war being such a vicious war. Um, John. Just to come in with what you were struggling with. Uh, I, I think people see these representations of his acts, and some 
sometimes walk away and think, well, he's schizophrenic because today he's mad, tomorrow he's filled with love. And we see a New Testament God portrayed in a whole different characterization than in the Old Testament. But God is consistent with himself. And his throne is built on mercy and righteousness. And so all that he does is completely perfect and, and, and holy and righteous. That will bypass our, our understanding. But he's the same God today that he was then. And he's the same God then that he is today. And, and, it's, and you said something, Dave, which is very common. And that is, well, I, I've been told that God was a compassionate God, that he's a merciful God. He is. But we completely skip the part that he is a completely holy God and he is a... He's a righteous God, and He is a God of judgment when it's necessary. You know, God will not be mocked, we are told. You know, those that are deserving of judgment will be judged. Um, Jesus, most people have this picture of Jesus as being gentle, Jesus, sweet and mild. You know, blonde hair, blue eyes, not much muscle. Um, that's not Jesus at all. This is a man who worked with his hands. This is a man who, who took the time to make a whip out of knotted cords to drive the money changers out of the temple. Okay? This is not a wimp. And Jesus got mad about stuff. Because there's some things that you need to get mad about. You know, God judged and God punished because there are some things that need to be judged and some things that people need to be punished for. And in the case of the Canaanite people, the indication from everything that we know from other sources and everything we read in Scripture, they needed to be punished. In fact, they were so bad, the only appropriate thing was to get rid of them altogether. As hard as that is for us to hear, that is the righteous God decided that was what needed to be done. Okay? We should take care of some of the Navigansland and stuff that's going on right now. Judy? Zap them away. Well, what about, what about today? There's so many evil people, yes. evilness going on in the world today. Right? Yeah. Well, God didn't deal with every evil back then either. Um, he... God knows which ones need to be dealt with at what time, but eventually all will be dealt with. I mean, right. the, the nature of it is that is the consummation, everybody will be called to give account for their sins. Now, those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ, our sins will be covered by the blood of Christ. Those who have not accepted Christ, who have committed abominations and sins, they will be held to account in ways I don't even care to dream about for what they have done wrong. I mean, there is... There is evil in the world, but it, it rains on the righteous and unrighteous alike. You know, but God will not be mocked. The only, and we say, well, why doesn't He do it? Yeah. Scripture says the reason is because he, he tarries, He delays, so that more people will have an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Michael. If you really think about how vast and the, He wiped out mankind with in the time of Noah, mm -hmm. the ark, that seems... Uh, that makes, I think, what the Canaan, what happened in Canaan, seem kind of pale in yeah. comparison. And you can think of these waters receding and dead bodies everywhere. Yeah. I mean, that, that's pretty <coughs> gruesome. Yeah, it wouldn't have been pleasant. Okay, let's keep moving here. So this is the Mosaic Covenant. The next one, I've got about 15 minutes here to finish, is the Davidic Covenant. Again, the three large covenants that we're aware of are the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, and the Davidic, made with the three most important figures of the Old Testament, Moses, uh, Ab uh, Abraham, Moses, and David. So the Davidic covenant is the promise which God made to David to establish his house, which means his descendants as a dynasty, and especially to have David's son sit on the throne of Israel after him. That promise included that David's son would build God's temple. God said to David, even though David wanted to build the temple, he said, this is not for you to do. You can get ready for it, and David had plans drawn up, he had materials gathered, but it was for Solomon, David's son, to build the temple. And no matter what Solomon did, God said he would not remove him from, excuse me, remove him from the throne as he had with Saul. He says he would not remove his love from him as he did with Saul, because Saul violated God's uh, plans. And that David's royal line would last forever. Um, you know, it carried on to Jesus as a descendant of David. And all the way up until the time of Jesus, people expected the Messiah to come of the line of David, they had been told, to be a king like David. So that dynasty, that expectation, even though there was not somebody actually sitting on the throne of Israel all that time, that, that house of David still remained, and then became fulfilled in Jesus, who was a descendant of David, on his you know, mother's side. Um, so the Davidic covenant reaffirmed 
was reaffirmed directly to Solomon, but with the added condition that if Solomon failed to fulfill all of the demands, that his, or if his descendants did, uh, that they did not faithfully worship God, that they would cut off Israel eventually from the land. Now, there's a point here. We're going to see the Davidic covenant and then the reaffirmation to Solomon. Some of the covenants we've talked about are unconditional covenants. The covenant to Abraham was unconditional. The covenant to Noah was unconditional. The covenant to David was unconditional. It's not like, you do this, and God says, I'll do this. Now, the Mosaic covenant, they had to follow the law, worship only one God. The Abrahamic covenant later, they had to be circumcised, they had to agree, you know, to, to be obedient to God. So those were conditional. I think to, to realize an unconditional covenant is very much like our salvation as Christians. There is nothing that you... Well, let me, let me do the, the covenant part first. In the unconditional covenants, there is nothing required of David or of Noah um, or even of Adam in terms of he doing anything in order for the covenant to be established and move forward. Yet it was possible to do something to violate the covenant. You hear that? Nothing was required for them to do for the covenant to be granted to them. That's the royal grant type of covenant. That was to Adam. That was to Noah. That was the first commitment to Abraham, but then later it came back and there was conditions. That, that's the covenant to David. They were royal grant type covenants. There was nothing required of them for it to be established, but they could do something to violate it. In the case of Adam, he didn't respect the one thing God asked him to do. All right? And now what happens is, when God reaffirms the Davidic covenant to Solomon, as you'll see, he adds, yes, but it's possible, even though you don't have to do anything for this covenant to be established because of your father David, you can violate it. You can break this covenant by your own choice. To me, that's how uh, we need to understand our salvation. The, the issue is, okay, is it once saved, always saved, or can you lose your salvation, etc.? Uh, that question has come up, and I spent a lot of time studying that, because there are verses that seem to say, once you're saved, you're always saved. There are other verses that talk about, you know, hold out so that you don't lose your salvation. I believe that the right answer to that difference is, there is nothing that you can do to cause God to stop loving you and lose your salvation. But you can throw your salvation away. You can reject God. You can reject that salvation. Okay? You, if you are saved, you are in Christ, you have faith in Him, and you commit a sin, you are not going to be unsaved because you sinned. But you can lose your salvation if you reject Jesus after that. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. To reject what you know to be the truth about Jesus. Okay? Same thing is true with the covenants. The, the royal grant kind of covenants, the people did not have to do anything to make the covenant happen, but they could reject it. They could throw it away. All right, let's look at the examples, the Davidic covenant, and then the reaffirmation of Solomon being an example. The covenant to David in 2 Samuel 7. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will look, I, I took you from the pasture, have, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut all your enemies off from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish your kingdom, his kingdom. He is the one, this Solomon, he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by human beings, with floggings inflicted by human hands. In other words, God won't judge him, but people will if he does the wrong thing. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom, David, will endure forever before me, your throne will be established forever. Okay. David is given this as a grant. This is actually toward the end of his life. And God is saying, in response for you having been a faithful servant, even though he sinned and confessed those sins and paid consequences of those sins, he still was a faithful servant. God gives him the promise of a dynasty that will last forever and that his son will sit on the throne and that his son will be secure on that throne through his whole life. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. 
Okay, I realize that he's talking about Solomon is going to be the one to raise the temple. Mm -hmm. but isn't the Lord talking that he's talking about that he says, I will be his father and he will be my son? Isn't he talking about Jesus there? I don't think so. I think he's still talking about um, Solomon because he says, He is the one who built my house and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he will be my son. Um, because even in my Bible, in the notes, um, I think it has uh, references to Christ. Uh, some people may have looked at that and said this might be a messianic um, type thing, a, a messianic imagery. Um, and it's possible, but I think the obvious reading here is that he is talking about Solomon, because he talks about him, you know, building the house for his name, establishing the throne um, for his kingdom forever. There could be a messianic imagery that's being used there, uh, but I think that the obvious reading, <coughs> reading is that he's talking about Solomon. But that, that could be as well. Well, let's look. I mean, this is the this is the Davidic covenant that's spoken to David. Now, let's look at how it was reaffirmed to David's son when Solomon when Solomon takes over. The Lord said to him, Solomon, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness. Now notice that there was no condition on David, but Solomon, there are conditions put here. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. Now, he told David, I promise you that your son Solomon will sit on the throne his whole life. Now he's telling Solomon, if you're obedient to me, then it will go on further than that. But if not, it goes on, but if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commandments and decrees I give, have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Well, because of Solomon worshiping other gods and encouraging that, after his death, the kingdom split in two and then over the next several hundred years were just, was destroyed. The Israelites in the north, the northern kingdom of Israel, were conquered by the Assyrians in uh, 722 BC and carried off into captivity and never to be heard from again, really, as a people. That, those are the lost tribes of Israel. We have the Samaritans who were half-breeds uh, between the Jews and slaves who were brought in by the Assyrians. And then in the south, the southern kingdom of Judah, with Jerusalem as its capital, was destroyed in 586 BC by Babylon. They lasted longer because they had a few good kings. There were no kings in the north that were considered good. In the south, they had some kings uh, like Jehoshaphat, uh, Hezekiah, Josiah. They were actually good kings, Hezekiah and Josiah especially. And so God kept giving them a chance, but then they would die, and their sons would come along and start worshiping false gods again. Uh, it's a really rank kind of story. First in the back, run. Uh, quickly, uh, the only non-conditional or unconditional, were, uh, and they could be canceled if violated, I guess was the Adamic um, mosaic. And not the mosaic. Not the mosaic. The mosaic had conditions all along. I'm sorry. Uh, Adamic, uh, no. Noic, yes. And David. David. And the Davidic. The, the, at first, God had no conditions on Abraham. That's why we say the Abrahamic covenant. When God first called Abram, there really were no conditions. God made promises to him and then said, if you, if you accept those promises, come along. And Abram did. Ten years later, when he changed his name to Abraham, then he introduced circumcision and other requirements that had to be fulfilled in order to be able to the law. So the non-conditional royal grant types, which are on the chart if you download it, would be the Adamic, which was a parody actually, a parody agreement. Um, the Noic, the, um, the first phase of the Abrahamic and the Davidic. Okay? All right, so, but God, when he reaffirms his covenant to David, to David's son Solomon, he does put conditions on it. And then the last covenant I want to look at is the new covenant. The new covenant was promised through the prophet Jeremiah. You can make the argument, it appears in other places too, but Jeremiah is the most obvious. And it was an unconditional promise that God would renew his loving commitment to his people and would put his law in their minds and on their hearts so that Everyone would know him. No one would have to teach this because God would make sure they all got it. 
And as part of this new covenant, God promised that he would forgive all of the wickedness and no longer note or remember the sins of the people. And he says his forgiveness will be even if they are unfaithful. So this is really unconditional. Even if they don't deserve it, he will reaffirm his commitment to the people. The incarnation and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ is seen as the ultimate fulfillment of that new covenant redemption promise. So what Jeremiah promises in the 31st chapter of the uh, book of the prophet Jeremiah is seen as being ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Right? Let's look at a couple of those passages. From Jeremiah 31, starting with the 31st verse. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Remember, the northern kingdom was called Israel, the southern kingdom was called Judah. So he's talking to the split kingdoms now. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. He was faithful to them, in other words. Declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is the new covenant promise in Jeremiah and elsewhere in the Old Testament. Now, I could give you a lot of verses in the New Testament, but let me give you this one because it specifically mentions the new covenant. Hebrews 9, starting with the 13th verse. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean. He's talking about Jewish uh, sacrifice of animals for forgiveness of sins. Um, sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they were outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences, consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And here it is. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. For those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So Jeremiah 31 promises a new covenant where God will put his law, which means the instruction on our hearts and minds, and that he will forgive all and love all. And then Jesus is identified as the mediator of that new covenant. It is through him and his grace that all of our sins can be forgiven. And we can be completely loved and accepted. All right? Questions about that? Those covenants are all in that chart that you will find online. I want to spend just the last five minutes now talking about the covenant theology. I said earlier that I've been talking about uh, a theology of covenant. Covenant theology is a very specific thing. Covenant theology is... Um, the, uh, I've got these out of order here. Uh, hang on. There we go. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong slide. Covenant theology is a conceptual overview and interpretive framework for understanding the overall flow of the Bible. It's, it's sort of like a, a way to structure our thinking when we look at Scripture, using the theological concept of covenant as an organizing principle for Christian theology. This is sort of what Icro did. That this becomes the structure that we understand the rest of Scripture in. But covenant theology was a specific historic kind of movement that viewed the history of God's dealing with humankind under the framework of three overarching theological covenants. The covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. Now these are called theological covenants because they're not explicitly presented in the Bible, and yet, when you study the Word, it seems to, they seem to be theologically clear that this is what's happening, what's being talked about. Within historical Reformed Christian system, Presbyterian Church is part of the uh, Reformed theology movement, starting with the our theology as articulated by John Calvin. All right? Within the historical Reformed Christian systems of thought, covenant theology is viewed as the structure by which the biblical text organizes itself. So this is a Reformed doctrine. The alternative to this is dispensationalism, believing that God worked a certain way up at a certain time in history, and then he got to a place and said, well, that's not working. I'm going to have to try something else. And then he started all over with a different agreement. That, I believe, violates our basic understanding of who, who God is, and so did Calvin. And that's why a different way of organizing our thinking here. Covenant theology is a prominent feature in churches holding a Calvinist view of theology, such as Reformed churches and Presbyterian churches, 
the Reformed churches would be Reformed Church of America, the Dutch Reformed Church, um, in Canada it's the United Church, would be that. Um, Presbyterian churches, Reformed Baptist churches, and in different forms, some Methodist churches. So it's pretty predominant in, in Protestant churches. Now, let's talk about those three uh, different covenants. The first is the covenant of redemption. Now again, there's no place in Scripture that specifically talks about this, but we can take this as being the, a way of understanding what is said in Scripture. The covenant of redemption is the eternal agreement between the three persons of the Godhead. That is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Godhead is the word when you're talking about all three of the persons together. In which the Father appoints the Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit to redeem his elect people from guilt, from the guilt and power of sin. In other words, the covenant of redemption is God's plan to save us using the sacrifice of his Son and the power of his Holy Spirit to convict our hearts to that. Initiated by God the Father. Okay? And there are a bunch of scriptures I could use. This one, Revelation 5, 8, and 10, I think gets at it. The four living creatures and the 24 elders, this is describing uh, heaven, fell down before the Lamb, which is Jesus the Son. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You, that is Jesus, the Lamb, are worthy to take the scroll and open its seal because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God, that is God the Father, members of every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This is the picture uh, in Revelation of heaven in which the Lamb is recognized and honored as being the only one worthy to open the seal because he was obedient to God the Father in making the sacrifice necessary to save us. So this is a reflection of that redemption covenant that God has within himself for, for our sake. The covenant commitment to save us from ourselves. Okay? The second covenant is the covenant of works. This is the covenant which first was established in the Garden of Eden because of uh, God and Adam as the federal head, between God and Adam as the federal head of all humanity. Federal head means that he's the, the, the uh, chief executive officer. You know, he's, he's the one who's over everything. This covenant of works is seen as implied in creation, as I said earlier, that is the natural laws that govern all creation, and is more explicitly in God's provision in the garden and following the fall and in the limiting of uh, penalty or punishment after the fall. It was not called a covenant in Genesis. And Hosea 6 7 says, as at Adam, in other words, as with Adam, they have broken the covenant, they were unfaithful to me. That's, that's the thing that affirms that there was a covenant with Adam. Now, sometimes um, this is seen as the covenant of works is sort of the start of a covenant of law, which is do this and live. Okay? I believe that this was a parody kind of covenant, with covenant where God wanted to be friends, to have fellowship, and have mutual respect, even though it was God and it was Adam, <coughs> and yet it was violated. But this covenant of works, this idea that we have something we're expected to do, that became reflected in the Old Testament law, that there were obligations we had to fulfill in order to be saved, goes back to the Garden of Eden at first. Okay? And the third one of the three covenants that are part of uh, covenant theology, and I, I didn't make this up, okay? uh, I don't know if I made that clear. This started even before Calvin, it goes all the way back to um, St. Augustine and Irenaeus, the early church fathers. It was uh, articulated very clearly, I believe, by Calvin. And then comes down to us through a lot of theological considerations since then. The third covenant is the covenant of grace. This is the promise of eternal life for all people who receive forgiveness of their sins through substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. So the covenant of redemption is God's plan to save us. The covenant of works is sort of like the covenant of law, which started from the Garden of Eden, where it said, you people have certain things you have to do to meet God's expectations. And then we have ultimately the covenant of grace which is the fact that only by accepting the atonement that Jesus provides through his sacrifice for us, that, that's all that's required for us to be saved. Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Alive in Christ. Okay. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And this verse you probably have heard. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves is a gift of God, 
not by works so that no one can boast. This covenant of grace is, it's nothing you do. That's sort of what I was getting at earlier. It's entirely by the act of Jesus, the grace that we receive. All right? Now, all of this in terms of Reformed theology is reflected in the Westminster Confession, which is one of the great confessions of the church. I'm going to read this for you. It's uh, the chapter 7. There's three quick slides here, and then we're done. Because this might help you understand what we're talking about when we talk about the covenant uh, about um, covenant theology. Seventh chapter of the Westminster Confession is of God's covenant with man. The distance between God and the creature is so great, we being the creature, that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. In other words, nothing we do would be sufficient to receive God's blessing. And so he has condescended or accommodated to provide that. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam, and in him to his posterity, upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. Man, by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, sin kept us from being able to fulfill that covenant, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offers unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him, that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained into eternal life his Holy Spirit, to make them willing and able to believe. There's that part about the Holy Spirit is given to make us willing and able to believe. The covenant of grace is frequently set forth in Scripture by the name of a testament, in reference to the death of Jesus Christ, the testator, I mentioned that earlier, that's from Hebrews, and to the everlasting inheritance with all things belonging to him therein bequeathed. This covenant was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. Under the law it was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the Paschal Lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews. This is the Old Testament way of trying to get uh, grace. All for, for signifying, that was a new word to me, for signifying, Christ to come, which were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah, by whom they had full remission of sins and eternal salvation, and is called the Old Testament. One more. Under the Gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, when, when Christ became a man, in other words, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the Word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's how we become aware of Christ. Which, though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them is held forth in more fullness evidence of spiritual eff efficacy to all nations, both Jews and Gentiles, and is called the New Testament. There are not, therefore, two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under different dispensations. Now, this isn't dispensationalism. Dispensation means different time periods. The same grace God gave the Old Testament people, the Jews, one way to achieve His grace, and then with the coming of Jesus Christ, we were given a different way to receive it. It's all still an act of grace by God. And that's what covenant theology comes into, that all of it is part of His covenant agreement with us. Okay? You may need to read that again two or three or four times, and it is available to you online. Any questions? What's our assignment? For next time, read the Anderson book, pages 287 to 324. And we're almost reading, we're almost finished with reading Anderson. We've got like two more short passages after this. So, Any other questions? No. Thank you guys. Blessings. Have a great week. Don't forget to check out litchapala.org. www.litchapala.org.